Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose, for inviting me to be part of this great faculty and to work and to, uh, to show you an overview of the development in glaucoma. Uh, we are not exactly here in the, in the retinal disease and in the posterior part of the eye, but I will uh, give you uh, an idea of this disease that uh, brings information and uh, pathophysiology from the anterior segment of the eye and also will go back to the back of the eye. I have no financial interest on my own in this presentation. What is glaucoma? Glaucoma is a disease that is the second cause of, blind, of blindness in the world, with one million people in France uh, suffering from glaucoma and uh, approximately 10 million that will go blind progressively in the next few years from uh, a total of several, uh, uh, several million, probably uh, 70 to 80 million people. Initially, it's a disease of the pressure. It's a pressure. The pressure is high in glaucoma, but it causes uh, an impact on the posterior part of the, of the nerve of the, uh, of the eye, especially at the level of the optic nerve. The pressure is regulated by the fact that the, 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 the synthesis production is back to the iris, go through the pupil, and is eliminated through the trabecular meshwork in a canal that is circular canal, Schlem's canal. In the angle, uh, constituted by the iris and the cornea. But the major consequence of glaucoma is optic neuropathy with degeneration of ganglion cells that may, co that may cause uh, eventually uh, total blindness and definitive intractable blindness. There are two main types of glaucoma, uh, open angle glaucoma and angle closure glaucoma, which means that there is a question relating to uh, the angle, the angle is there, it's the angle constituted by the cornea and the iris because the, the uh, outflow of the aqueous humor is located in this area. A question of angle, one is narrow angle or angle closure. The, the mechanism is the fact that the aqueous outflow cannot be uh, obtained because there are an access to the trabecular meshwork that is not uh, no more uh, accessible, and uh, the consequence is that there is a blockage of the iris to the trabecular meshwork, and the fact that the pressure is high, especially when the, uh, the pupil is dilated during the night, for example. But the treatment of this kind of glaucoma is not pharmacological, it's mechanical, either by laser or by surgery. So the most important part of pharmacology around glaucoma is uh, concerning the uh, ang open angle glaucoma in which there is no problem of access to the, uh, of the aqueous to the trabecular meshwork, but more a question of the filter itself. Here, with the new imaging technique we can have now, you can observe the trabecular meshwork, this triangle here, and the Schlem's canal is there. So the question is the access through a damaged trabecular meshwork. Here is the eye magnification of the trabecular meshwork. There is a major dramatic degeneration of trabecular meshwork cells with the decrease of the density of the cells, here in red, with an increase of uh, the, the, the matrix, the extracellular matrix, and there is a, an imbalance. The higher matrix, the lower, the higher toxicity to the cells, the lower cells, the higher matrix because of the, uh, the, uh, the balance and the regulation of the matrix by the cells with accumulation of proteins, of oxidative stress, aging process, and the consequence is the degeneration of the cells, which means that it's a, like uh, many other uh, degeneration process, uh, chicken and egg story, but the consequence is uh, this major uh, decrease of the outflow of the aqueous humor to the damaged tissue. The second, obviously more important consequence is the fact that progressively the increased pressure in the eye has consequences to retinal ganglion cells with the progressive cupping of the optic disc, like here, with, that correspond to a degeneration of the axon of retinal ganglion cells, with, of course, a corresponding decrease in visual function, initially in the periphery of the eye, and progressively going toward the center and the end stage of glaucoma is total blind blindness. Regarding the treatment, the treatment is initially uh, pharmacological with uh, a series of, uh, of medications that are 
only aim at decreasing the IOP, the intraocular pressure. This is, this is the only validated treatment for glaucoma. And there are different ways. One is to decrease the production of aqueous humor using beta blockers, car carbonic uh, uh, anhydrase inhibitors, or alpha-2 agonists. The other way is to increase the outflow through the uveoscleral pathway that is uh, uh, normally an accessory uh, outflow for the, uh, for the aqueous humor that in fact can be increased, especially with some medication like prostaglandins or alpha-2 agonists. We may also use a very old medication, cholinergic agents like pilocarpine, that may also act at the level of the trabecular meshwork. The standard of care for glaucoma is to start with one medication when the pressure is recognized as high or glaucoma is identified, and then uh, two and three and so on medication. And this is necessary in all, approximately 40% of the patient, which is very high. When it's not enough and the glaucoma uh, pro uh, still progresses, it's necessary to add other strategy, laser, surgery. Unfortunately, there are different problems related to the wound healing process after surgery, which result in additional pressure going back again at a high level, and then medication and the story is continuing. The story regarding the, the pharmacology of glaucoma uh, has known uh, an incredible acceleration. During one century, only three medications, uh, diamox, acetolozamide, pilocarpine, and some adrenergic agents with very high level of side effects. And then one medication, the first beta blocker topical, topically applied, uh, occurred in the early 80s. And then during the 90s, three new families were developed. One century for two, three medication, and three families in the 90s in one decade, which was very important, especially with the, the, uh, the development of prostaglandin, with now nine medications uh, that are on the market. Prostaglandin are now the first, uh, first line therapy by this property to uh, increase the uveous outflow, so decrease efficiently the pressure with a low rate of side effects. Low, but not new. In the 2000s, the, uh, the improvement was considered to, to uh, be necessary to focus on the comfort, the quality of life of the patient, especially with the development of fixed combination, which are aimed at, de at decreasing the burden of the, of the treatment, especially by decreasing the side effects by the combination, the preservative effect, and also to increase and to improve compliance. And we have now seven different associations on the market. So, in the 80s, three medication. Now we have a huge number of medication. And uh, the last decade was focusing on the side effects because the quality of life of patients treated for decades, 20 years, 30 years, all the lifespan is a very important aspect of the disease. Look at systemically with beta blockers, we are, which are well known to develop and to cause side effects but also topically, and especially the ocular surface of the eye, that is damaged by the huge and the long-term uh, use of treatment. And this damage is very important because it was underestimated and considered as neglectable uh, regarding the risk of going blind for those patients. But in fact, the side effects may be extremely annoying for the patient. One is just cosmetic, the change in the color under the, the use of prostaglandin. Of course, it may be a little bit annoying for those patients, again, to be, uh, to be uh, um, confronted of the risk of going blind. Another one is a little bit funny, the eyelash growth that is increased by prostaglandin. So this may be extremely interesting for women who are very happy with this kind of side effects. And especially, there was a specific development of gel uh, in the US just for increasing the, the, the strength and the length of the eyelashes. But you can understand that for this, you, this man, it was not exactly the aim uh, of the, uh, the, the, his life to have a very nice eyelashes. Much more important, allergy, toxic reaction, dryness, instability of the tear film uh, may impair the quality of life of those patients. 
This seems to be extremely uh, uh, mild in severity, but in fact, an abnormal tear film like you can observe here in the patient treated for, for glaucoma is uh, really, has really an impact on the quality of vision. It's not a question of visual acuity, it's a question of quality of vision, and this impairment is now well recognized. It was clearly uh, a very important impact. If you go to the very severe side effect, like here, to uh, asymptomatic uh, inflammatory reaction, you can observe that the frequency is, of course, extremely uh, uh, large in, uh, in percentage, but it's not, it's not nothing because at least 50% of the patient experience side effects due to their medication. One major component is preservative. The preservative is a, a compound that is just aimed to protect the bottle from contamination. So it's important from a pharmacological point of view or a safety point of view, but it may cause uh, many side effects. I have no time to develop that, but those are related to the cornea, to the conjunctiva, and the, they may influence the outcome of glaucoma treatment. So this is very important. And the last development, oh, uh, another point, we know that uh, this compound is able to penetrate deep in the eye. This is a model in animal with especially uh, here concentration in the trabecular meshwork. So we treat with this, the toxic compound then penetrate in the trabecular meshwork so may influence further degeneration, also in the lens, and up to the optic nerve head, with an activation of the glial cells uh, throughout the retina. So this is a challenge that is very important because now it's very, it's most important to develop new medication that are able to protect those patients to develop not only the side effects, but also develop the low grade of toxicity, of oxidative stress, of inflammatory stress that is already present in glaucoma and that may be uh, increased uh, following uh, long, very long-term uh, treatment. We have now a preservative-free formulation. This is a, the more recent progresses in uh, glaucoma pharmacology throughout the last decades, but there is a lot of education to be done because uh, ophthalmologists are not, not yet fully aware of this problem. New drug developments are in the pipeline. One strategy is to improve the efficacy of the treatment. One is uh, amazing because uh, it's uh, uh, the use of donors of nitric oxide that increase the efficacy of different drugs. It is almost developed and it will be probably uh, very soon marketed uh, with the latanoprostane, a derivative of latanoprost, of prostaglandin, and the association with the NO donor has an impact on the trabecular meshwork and may help on the different levels uh, to, uh, to increase the pressure by two millimeters of mercury. That is not bad at all. Sorry. Another option is slow release administration. One also is on the pipeline with the phase three studies ongoing with bamatoprost, another prostaglandin, with a slow release, which means an in, uh, injection into the anterior chamber of a device that, uh, that um, causes a sustained release of bamatoprost. It seems to work approximately four months, maybe six months, which seems to be very interesting, and it will be soon uh, also adapted to other drugs. So, so low release administration over the long term to decrease the burden of the treatment is obviously another option. Disease modifiers, for example, in our group, we found that another prostaglandin, not acting on FP receptor, but EP receptor, not only improved the uveal scleral outflow like other prostaglandin, but also may act uh, against the TGF beta effect on the trabecular meshwork, which means that at the same time, the aqueous humor is uh, uh, going out of the eye through the classical pathway of uveoscleral uh, pathway, there is also a way to increase the outflow through the trabecular meshwork and maybe to counteract the effect of a major cytokine, that is uh, TGF-beta. And, of course, development of new families. Some of them are maybe a little bit funny. It's not exactly pharmacology, and uh, there is an approach that cannot be, can be non-pharmacological, like uh, 
resveratrol or cannabinoid, there are different ways of administration that can be used. But it's obvious that probably a more sophisticated way and evidence-based medicine will bring us some, uh, information that will be uh, very in interesting in the future to know where or not, whether or not this uh, medication will be usable for the patient. So there are a huge list of candidates that can be developed. At that time, probably ROC, ROC kinase inhibitors are the most advanced uh, new drugs in the pipeline with phase three uh, studies and probably an approval that will be in the next few years. Uh, the action of ROC uh, inhibitors is to regulate the, the contraction of, uh, of smooth muscle or even at the level of the cytoskeleton, especially at the level of the trabecular meshwork cells. So it may increase the, the outflow through the trabecular meshwork. This is an interesting approach because there is no or very little families of um, very few drugs acting on this part of the pharmacology. There is also a potential for no protection of the optic nerve that is uh, on, on, under investigation, but potential side effects like hyperemia, and hyperemia uh, may be also associated to a potential uh, toxicity to the endothelial cells. The endothelial cells are cells that are extremely important to the transparency of the cornea, and like neurons, they do not divide in humans. So to protect them is, of course, very important. Another approach from our own lab was developed by uh, uh, different colleagues. And uh, I just want to show you very quickly this approach. This is a the blockage of a chemokine, and especially a chemokine receptor. This is an interesting balance. SDF1, CXCL12, is a protective chemokine that may be demonstrated as protecting trabecular cells from degeneration, and this chemokine acts through a receptor, CXCR4. But under the, uh, the influence of different chemokines or MMPs, this chemokine may be cleaved, and the cleave cleaved uh, SDF1 change and acts through another receptor, CXCR3, and the effect is apoptotic, and it causes a balance, a shift to a toxic phenotype, and this receptor in this cleaved form is toxic for trabecular meshwork cells, like probably other systems, of course, but we, I'm talking about glaucoma and trabecular meshwork. What we did, and it, we, it can be reversed, what we did was the blockage of the negative receptor, CXCR3. And we showed that after just two in subconjunctival injection, the pressure that was very high in the model of glaucoma was reduced for at least two weeks. Probably not because with, a feel, with a lack of effect over two weeks. With protection of trabecular network cell degeneration and of course at the same time protection of, against RGC, probably through the decrease of the intraocular pressure. I will come back soon to this picture and I just ask you to, to remember this aspect of the decrease for two weeks following blockage of, the, of a receptor to a toxic chemokine. Why? Because we are still lacking a treatment. We are talking about pharmacology of glaucoma by talking about pharmacology of intraocular pressure. Reduction of intraocular pressure is the only target that has been demonstrated to be efficient to prevent blindness related to glaucoma. It's efficient, but not always. We still lack a treatment that would be able to protect uh, retinal ganglion cell degeneration at the level of the optic nerve. This is neuroprotection, of course, and possibly in the future, neuroregeneration. We have probably, we have understood that IOP intraocular pressure as a major effect on neuropathy, but also on the trabeculopathy with an interaction between both. But there are also many other factors that may also interact with this, the two degeneration, the one that causes increased pressure, the one that causes blindness. Many other factors that could be addressed and that could interact separately to uh, 
bring and to, to cause further degeneration of the different tissues, both at the level of the trabecular meshwork or at the level of the optic nerve. 20 to 25 percent of glaucoma develop without any increased pressure. And despite a well-controlled intraocular pressure, approximately 20% of glaucoma still continue to progress, although the pressure has, will, has been well-controlled, which means that we need an approach to protect the optic nerve for, from further degeneration, or maybe we don't understand everything in glaucoma degeneration. So we need this approach, and we need, of course, to well understand the development of glaucoma, of uh, optic nerve degeneration in glaucoma. Of course, the, optic, the ocular hypertension cause blockage of the axonal transport and blockage of neurotrophic factors at the level of the axon, especially through the lamina cribrosa, the, the place where the axon uh, goes uh, out of the eye and cross the sclera. But there is also an increase, uh, an effect of the pressure on the blood vessels, and also on the, uh, the glial activation. Then further degeneration, and through an excitotoxic uh, factor, the, the first RGC dying will cause uh, additional signal that will cause the death of other RGCs. The first, in uh, experimental models, the first stress that comes is the inflammatory stress at the level of microglia. So this is maybe an approach that could be interesting. But we have now also ways to address the question about the, uh, the vascular pathway and the vascular flow, especially with the very nice imaging techniques with OCT. This is done without any injection. And we observe that where the RGC are degenerating uh, have been uh, lost, like here, all this uh, superior part of the, uh, of the uh, perimacular area or here at the level of the optic nerve, there is obviously a, a loss of the, uh, the vascular bed. So the neuroprotective strategy may be based either on increasing survival factors or trying to decrease the death factors. And the death factors are extremely numerous. We may act on the inflammatory stress. So of course we may act by increasing the neurotrophic factors, but we may also try to block the oxidative stress, the inflammatory stress, or the excitotoxic stress, or the apoptotic stress. So we have different strategies. And indeed, the candidates for neuroprotection that have been tested in the past in different uh, models are extremely numerous. Many, many candidates have been tested and seem to be extremely interesting attractive and seem to give extremely good results, especially in animals. But in humans, it's another story. Brimonidine is a compound, an alpha-2 agonist, that seems to have done to, to give some kind of neuroprotection in addition to the uh, lowering effect to the pressure. But brimonidine, uh, memantine, uh, has been a, a great uh, hope in the 90s, and after a 10 years clinical trial with more than 1,000 patients, non-significant result what the placebo was, were found. It was, of course, a very, very sad story because we are still lacking a neuroprotective agent based on definitive clinical uh, data. But it's very, very difficult uh, approach and very difficult mainly for methodological uh, aspect and maybe also because we are lacking uh, uh, the different criteria to develop definitively in humans the proof of concept of a neuroprotecting agent. I have no time to develop that. Of course, the methodological and ethical uh, aspect in clinical trials is very, very important to consider. But like this uh, uh, nice uh, editorial, uh, we should not give up this uh, story. So another promising strategy could be based on uh, stem cells. So we, have, we can develop stem cells or developing regeneration either at the level of trabecular meshwork or at the level of the optic nerve, of course. One approach is uh, IPS. That could be uh, very interesting. Uh, I have no ex personal experience, so I will not talk about that. But effectively, in different models, IPS 
cells injecting, injected in the trabecular meshwork or injected close to the retina in the vitreous uh, at the uh, phenotypes very close to trabecular meshwork cells or to retinal ganglion cells after injection, which means that the proof of concept can be very interesting to further develop, maybe in the humans. We have been working on another approach, uh, MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells, that can be also interesting. Multipotency, of course, development of cells, but maybe another approach that is more pharmacologic. Paracrine activity, indeed, may be interesting by the anti-inflammatory, uh, anti apoptotic uh, promoting uh, growth factors, survival factors, can be an approach that can be very interesting. We and other, here it's our work, here another work from a, another group, uh, showed that stem cell, after injection in, in the anterior chamber of the eye, can integrate into the anterior chamber, especially at the level of trabecular meshwork, or also in the ciliary body, which may be interesting for those cells that are able to uh, to synthesize and to uh, release promoting factors. And look at the effect on the pressure. A very quick response with decreased pressure for approximately two weeks after which the pressure uh, went up. Two weeks, quick response. The effect seems to be through TGF beta blockage and like it was shown after injection into the, uh, the vitreous, uh, stem cells are able to protect RGC from uh, cell death uh, following different injuries. So this seems, this seems to be very attractive. But you may understand that it may be difficult to get stem cells in humans to repeat injection over time, several times. And we know that the purification process is very, very important. For example, a bad experience we had recently, if we, the purification process is not enough, not pure enough, with a steel monocyte remaining at a level that seems to be very low, the effect of, to the eye is extremely inflammatory and extremely dangerous and deleterious. So we have to be very careful with this approach. And coming back to the, the schema a moment ago, you have here a decrease for two weeks, here you have a decrease for two, three weeks following the blockage of the receptor. We know that MSC may act through the stimulation of CXCR4. So maybe we are just facing an effect that is the same by uh, uh, um, an agonist uh, strategy to the, the cell survival receptor, and we get the same result as we got by blocking the antagonist of cell death receptor. Maybe it's just a pharmacological approach for the same, with the same consequence, and maybe in the future, Rather than MSC, it will be better to have pharmacological approach to block the cleavage or maybe to stimulate, to block the bad receptor, the negative cell death receptor. Where are we regarding uh, uh, stem cells in humans? Very few trials are ongoing, so for glaucoma compared to retina, so maybe we will have very good results. But we have to be aware that in, uh, in some, this example of liver uh, optic neuropathy, stem cells was used with an increase of quality of life in disease at three months, but nothing after one year of stem cell injection. This is humans. So the question about the future of stem cells can be raised, and some editorial are just challenging the strategy. And maybe the idea is that we need this research. We need to understand what stem cells are able to do, but maybe more to develop pharmacological strategies rather than going into cell therapy that will be uh, very difficult to achieve from a practical point of view. Very last question, the, the gene therapy. Uh, of course, uh, glaucoma is not a gene replacement therapy candidate. It's a, a gene therapy by using a transfection to, to transfect gene that would be able to promote uh, survival factor. So, of course, this approach is probably a very attracting because it may last for the long run compared to uh, stem cell uh, development and multiplication. But we have very, very uh, little information about that. At that time, just to conclude, we have to be aware that we do have neuroprotecting, effective neuroprotection for glaucoma. Only one, but this is well validated. It's intraocular pressure control. But also very important, early detection of glaucoma patient 
of course, is a way to protect them from going blind. And just because I have, I'm a, a little bit uh, over my time, just to, to thank my, my team, uh, with my co-director of the team, uh, Stefan Melik, Parsa Danyant, and all the team that participated to all those kind of research. Thank you very much.